We will discuss the concept of soil erodibility, look at test methods that can be used for measuring soil erosion parameters, review some videos of large-scale field tests to illustrate the significant differences that soil erodibility can make on Let's start by just discussing the concept of soil erodibility and why it matters for internal erosion. When we use the phrase erodibility, we're really just asking two questions. The first is, under the hydraulic loads imparted, does erosion occur? And then the second is, if erosion can occur, how quickly does it erode? The answers to these questions have a significant influence on our estimates of internal erosion failure probabilities. The soil erodibility determines whether or not internal erosion will initiate under the imposed hydraulic conditions and physiochemical environment. Thinking about concentrated leak erosion, internal erosion along cracks may not progress if the erosion rate of the soil is so slow that cracks are sealed due to swelling of the soil around the cracks or just material filling them in. This becomes important for other nodes in the event trees because a slow rate of erosion might increase the likelihood that we can detect leakage and eventually intervene or lower the reservoir before it progresses to failure. While we've covered the concept of soil erodibility conceptually, we also need a mathematical representation of the soil process so that we can do analysis. On this slide, you see constitutive laws for soil erosion that are commonly referred to as linear excess shear stress equations. This is because the erosion rate is proportional to the applied hydraulic shear stress in excess of some critical value. There are many different constitutive models that have been proposed in the literature for representing the erosion process. However, the ones shown on this slide are the most commonly used due to their simplicity and also due to the fact that there is a lot of uncertainty in the erosion parameters. Adding more complicated models with more parameters doesn't necessarily improve our estimates. The volumetric erosion law on the left of the slide just states that the erosion rate in terms of volume of material is equal to k sub d, which is an erodibility coefficient, times the applied hydraulic shear stress tau minus the critical shear stress. What this means, looking at this graph at the bottom of the slide, is that prior to this critical shear stress value, no erosion will occur. And once we pass the critical shear stress, our rate of erosion increases linearly, with the slope being k sub d, as the applied shear stress increases. This volumetric erosion law is the most commonly used because for assessing breach problems or internal erosion failure mechanism development, we're most often interested in the evolution of the geometry of the erosion boundaries. That's because this information is needed for assessing stability and hydraulics of the erosion problem. It can be expressed in terms of mass erosion, where the two are related by soil density. It's the exact same concept, just that the coefficient will be different because the mass erosion rate is in terms of the mass of soil removed. While we've covered the concept of soil erodibility conceptually, we also need a mathematical representation of the soil process so that we can do analysis. On this slide, you see constitutive laws for soil erosion that are commonly referred to as linear excess shear stress equations. This is because the erosion rate is proportional to the applied hydraulic shear stress in excess of some critical value. There are many different constitutive models that have been proposed in the literature for representing the erosion process. However, the ones shown on this slide are the most commonly used due to their simplicity
and also due to the fact that there is a lot of uncertainty in the erosion parameters. Adding more complicated models with more parameters doesn't necessarily improve our estimates. The volumetric erosion law on the left of the slide just states that the erosion rate in terms of volume of material is equal to k sub d, which is an erodibility coefficient, times the applied hydraulic shear stress tau minus the critical shear stress. What this means, looking at this graph at the bottom of the slide, is that prior to this critical shear stress value, no erosion will occur. And once we pass the critical shear stress, our rate of erosion increases linearly, with the slope being k sub d, as the applied shear stress increases. This volumetric erosion law is the most commonly used because for assessing breach problems or internal erosion failure mechanism development, we're most often interested in the evolution of the geometry of the erosion boundaries. That's because this information is needed for assessing stability and hydraulics of the erosion problem. It can be expressed in terms of mass erosion, where the two are related by soil density. It's the exact same concept, just that the coefficient will be different because the mass erosion rate is in terms of the mass of soil removed. Thinking back to the internal erosion mechanism of concentrated leak erosion, it's easy to see that the critical shear stress controls the initiation and likewise the erodibility coefficient k sub d controls the progression or rate of enlargement. These two parameters tau c and k sub d are measured through laboratory tests or estimated through correlations. In addition, Soils can be categorized into groups of erodibility based on these measured parameters. Here you see an example categorization of soils based on whole erosion tests. Numerous whole erosion tests were run on these soils to measure K sub D and tau C, and the soil types were grouped into relative categories based on how erodible the materials were. Likewise, here's another system that groups soils into different categories based on the critical shear stress or critical velocity for erosion. These thresholds are most often used when discussing erosion function apparatus measurements. We'll look into what these laboratory tests look like on later slides. While broad categories of erodibility, as shown in those classification systems, are quite useful for discussion because it keeps us all in a common reference frame as to what we mean when we say different degrees of erodibility, we need to be cautious of using broad categories like this. Erosion properties of soils are highly dependent on essentially all soil properties that alter its state. So it's not just the grading and plasticity, which correlates to the soil classification that matters, but also the density, the time, how long it's been in that current state, and even the history. So for example, the water content at compaction for embankments. Because of this sensitivity to so many parameters, errors can be really large, as we'll look at momentarily, when making predictions based off of broad categories. For this reason, it's important to understand general trends in how erosion properties change with changing soil properties, so that we can assess whether or not certain means of estimating erodibility are applicable to our problem. It's also useful to understand the trends
so that we can decide if correlations developed from specific data sets will also be applicable to our specific scenario for which we're trying to estimate soil erosion properties. Recently, one of the most comprehensive studies on soil erosion properties ever conducted was written by Jean-Louis Brio at Texas A&M for the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. As part of this study, they compiled over a thousand erosion tests, 750 of which were from the literature and the rest were from their own laboratory. This extensive data set of soil erosion measurements is useful for assessing general trends between soil properties and erosion parameters. And the authors also use this data set to develop many correlations that can be used to arrive at first estimates of soil erodibility. Here you see a list of some of the trends that were identified in this report. This list is not comprehensive, but hits on some of the major factors. For example, it was found that for coarse grain soils, an increase in D50 leads to an increase in erosion resistance. That is, larger particles are harder to move. On the other hand, regardless of the erosion test type, an increase in D50 leads to a decrease in erosion resistance when we're talking about finer soils. This is because for fine grain soils, an increase in D50 is usually accompanied by a decrease in plasticity. Likewise, in fine grain soils, erosion resistance increases as the C sub C, so coefficient of curvature, or C sub U, coefficient of uniformity of the gradation decrease. This is because high values of CU indicate broadly graded soils that likely have a larger coarse fraction, whereas for fine grain soils, a low CU indicates that it's almost all fine grained and probably has a high clay content and potentially plasticity. For all soils, erosion resistance increases as the percent clay increases and also increases as the plasticity increases. For fine grain soils, they found that erosion resistance increases with an increase in plastic limit. In many cases, the wet unit weight and undrank shear strength were directly proportional to erosion resistance. And lastly, water content seemed to have a positive impact on erosion resistance of finer soils in general. That is, wetter soils for fine-grained soil types are more erosion resistant once compacted because the soil is less flocculated. However, for coarse-grained soils, water content showed a negative effect on erosion resistance. We can look specifically at compaction effort influence and molding water content from the study results of Visser 2015. USDA did some research on this topic and found that the soil erosion resistance increases as the soil becomes denser, so it's more erodible at low compaction efforts and less erodible at high compaction efforts. Also, they found that when compacted drive optimum, the soil is more erodible because it has a more flocculated structure. Finally, as we said on the previous slide, an increasing clay fraction leads to a decrease in erodibility of the soil. The trends discussed on the previous slides were for non-dispersive soils. It's important to be cognizant of dispersive soils and where they occur. When we say dispersive soils, we are referring to soils in which the clay particles will detach from each other and from the soil structure and go into suspension, oftentimes without any external forces.
that is for a highly dispersive clay, you can just drop it in a glass of water and it will completely break down and appear to dissolve and become suspended. This type of behavior is related to the clay mineralogy and pore water chemistry. We need to be cognizant of where these soils fall geographically because they have extremely low critical shear stress values, essentially zero in some cases, which means that they're more susceptible to erosion initiating. Low plasticity dispersive clays are the most problematic because they'll initiate under really low values. And then once hydraulics kind of takes over, they'll um, progress quickly because lower plasticity clays are more erodible in the first place. So now that we've talked about these general ideas and trends in soil behavior, let's look at some of the test methods that are used to measure case of D and tau C. Here you see a fairly comprehensive list of all the different erosion apparatuses that have been proposed over the years. This comes from that Brio et al. 2019 report, if you're interested in learning more about these. However, in the context of embankment erosion, the most commonly used devices are the erosion function apparatus, the jet erosion test, and the hole erosion test. Those are the three tests that we'll discuss here today. The jet erosion test is one of the first erosion tests that was developed. This test was developed by the USDA for looking at stream bank erosion and spillway erosion, as well as embankment breach behavior. The test consists of a jet of water that's submerged under a water surface. That jet is put in close proximity to a soil surface and allowed to impinge on it. When the jet of water hits the soil surface, flow will go out radially around that center line, imparting a shear stress on the soil bed. As the soil erodes away from the jet, the jet diffuses more in the surrounding water so that the shear stress lowers, the applied shear stress lowers. Because of this, the erosion rate decreases with time as this hole increases in depth. These principles are used to recover a function that can be analyzed to obtain values of K sub D and tau C. The critical shear stress corresponds to the depth that this asymptotically approaches, whereas the um, K sub D value erodibility coefficient corresponds to the rate at which this hole deepens during the testing. One advantage of the jet erosion test is that it can be conducted in the field as shown in this photograph, but it can also be conducted on relatively small samples quite quickly in the laboratory as shown on the right. Here you see a proctor mold that's submerged in a tank of water in preparation for a jet erosion test. Hansen and Simon, while doing work for the USDA, assessed a large data set of jet erosion tests and proposed categories for um, erosion behaviors of soils based on the test results. Here on, you see the critical shear stress on the x-axis and K sub D on the y-axis with the categories broken out based on those values. As the critical shear stress increases, it becomes more resistant to erosion. Likewise, as the erosion coefficient decreases, it also becomes considered more resistant to erosion. On this slide, you see a photograph of the erosion function apparatus. This test was developed by Jean-Louis Brio at Texas A&M, with the primary focus being determining ways to predict bridge scour. In the EFA, a soil sample 
usually from a Shelby tube, is extruded into a channel that's four inches by two inches roughly. Um, at, at a constant velocity of water flowing above it. The soil samples kept flush with the surface and advanced as fast as it erodes to measure the erosion rate of the soil. This procedure is repeated for different velocities to determine the erosion function that describes how fast the soil erodes at different applied shear stresses. These figures show EFA test results for samples obtained from New Orleans levees. You can see that just within that area and those structures, the erosion behavior varied a great deal. On these plots, we're looking at the full erosion function. So it's not just one point per soil because they haven't been reduced down yet to give the values of tau C and KD. So for example, if we look specifically at these yellow points, you can see that this is just the erosion rate for different flow velocities in EFA for that one sample. These erosion functions can be post-processed to yield estimates of KD and tau C as well, so that they can be compared directly to the jet erosion test. On these plots, you also see proposed categories of erodibility of soils. These are not the same categories as proposed for categorizing data with the jet test, and we must be cognizant of that as we try to prepare, compare test results. Based on the compilation of data in the NHCRP report, Brio tried to propose general categories of erosion behavior by soil type as shown on this slide. It's really important to note that a single soil type can bridge a large range and that soil classification is a terrible indicator of soil erodibility if we need to be um, fairly accurate in our estimates. Because of this, it is not a good idea to use these charts to estimate soil properties. We should only use them when discussing general categories, for example, in the um, embankment breach parameter regression equations. And instead, we should rely more heavily on the correlations that are developed to predict erodibility based on specific soil properties. Finally, on this slide, you see the whole erosion test. The whole erosion test consists of a proctor mold that a compacted soil sample is prepared in, and an initial hole is drilled into the center of that mold so that we can induce flow through the hole and examine how it evolves. A constant head difference is applied across the sample so that we know exactly what the pressure is on either side of this proctor specimen and the outflow is measured. From the pressure difference across the sample and the flow rate, we can use pipe flow equations to infer what the diameter of the opening is. It should be noted that when making these calculations, it's assumed that there's a constant hole diameter across this entire sample. That's usually not truly the case. Based on the flow rate through the sample, over time, we can assess how the erosion rate of that hole changes as a function of the hydraulic load applied. This, just like the other tests, gives us a way to back calculate what the critical shear stress and K sub D value of that sample are. Here you see some results of whole erosion tests presented in terms of the initial shear stress that was applied on the sample through the hole and the erosion rate index from the whole erosion test. The erosion rate index is related to the mass 
coefficient of erodibility that we saw on the um, slide that showed the mass erosion rate version of the linear excess shear stress equation. Based on this index, whole erosion test data has also been grouped into categories that describe the erodibility of the soil. One last thing that we should note about the whole erosion test is that the soil sample has to be able to maintain a hole. Because of this, this test is restricted to fairly cohesive samples that will allow that hole to gradually evolve throughout the duration of the test. For samples without enough plasticity, they will not maintain the hole and the sample will crumble and fall apart so that you can't get adequate test results. The results of 61 laboratory hole erosion tests and 47 laboratory and field jet erosion tests performed by Bureau of Reclamation since 2007 are plotted on this figure. Although the hole erosion tests in general exhibit lower detachment rate coefficients and higher critical shear stresses than the jet erosion test data, both sets of data generally follow the same trend. Additionally, on this plot, you'll see two trend lines from USDA data sets. The blue line is from a 2001 study that Hansen and Simon did to evaluate the relationship between K sub D and tau C. Since 2001, they expanded their data set and in 2011 suggested the red line. The reclamation jet erosion data falls right in the bounds of these trends, which indicates that in general, K sub D is inversely proportional to tau sub C. That is, as the critical shear stress increases, the detachment rate coefficient also decreases. As I mentioned before, the mass erosion rate coefficient and the volumetric erosion rate coefficient are related to each other based on the soil density. Here on this slide, you see that relationship between K sub D and the whole erosion test index for various soil categories and erosion parameter ranges. As the jet erosion test and whole erosion test are the most commonly used tests in the dam industry, I think it's important to discuss some of the things to be aware of when comparing them um, in part so that you're familiar with how to relate data sets. In general, both tests yield similar erodibility classifications. That is, a soil that's highly resistant to erosion in one test will obviously be highly resistant in the other. However, the measured parameters are slightly different between the tests. The whole erosion test tends to yield higher values of tau C, and the jet erosion test tends to yield higher values of K sub D. This could be in part because the hydraulic loading on the soil is different between the two tests. With the jet erosion test, the load is normal to the soil surface, so there's probably larger pressure fluctuations. This could drive a higher erosion rate. While one test isn't necessarily better than the other, it's important to remember that you ought to select the test with flow conditions similar to the field scenario when possible. At the end of the day, all of these erosion tests are just a proxy for the actual loads that the soil will experience in the field during an internal erosion event or during an embankment overtopping a breach scenario. If the hydraulic conditions that we're testing in the lab are greatly different than those at the prototype scale, we're not accurately quantifying the behavior that we're hoping to represent in our models.
From a more practical perspective, a few other things to consider with the jet erosion test are that it works really well with a broader range of soils. Also, since it's able to be set up in the field, it's really easy to test um, soils in situ at your site and get actual measurements on the material without disturbing it. And then the last thing to note is that the case of D value that's used in physically based breach models like wind dam is intended to come from jet erosion tests. This is because those models were calibrated using jet erosion test data and physical breach experiments. Therefore, it's important that the erosion property data going into those models is consistent with the model calibration process. Lastly, let's take a look at some erosion parameters for gravel. It should be noted that the coarse grained regression equations from Brio et al. 2019 should not be used for gravel. Instead, another equation that Brio proposes that the critical shear stress is approximately equal to the D50 with the unit shown on the slide is more applicable for gravel soils. This equation has been shown to be consistent with earlier US Army Corps of Engineers studies as well. It should also be noted that this equation is only for clean gravels. When a large fine fraction becomes present in a gravelly soil, the finer soil will dominate the erosion behavior. For these cases, it's appropriate to use finer grain correlations to estimate the critical shear stress based on the properties of the fine fraction of the soil. Lastly, let's take a look at some erosion parameters for gravel. It should be noted that the coarse grained regression equations from Brio et al. 2019 should not be used for gravel. Instead, another equation that Brio proposes that the critical shear stress is approximately equal to the D50 with the unit shown on the slide is more applicable for gravel soils. This equation has been shown to be consistent with earlier US Army Corps of Engineers studies as well. It should also be noted that this equation is only for clean gravels. When a large fine fraction becomes present in a gravelly soil, the finer soil will dominate the erosion behavior. For these cases, it's appropriate to use finer grain correlations to estimate the critical shear stress based on the properties of the fine fraction of the soil.
So now let's take a look at some videos of breach experiments that were conducted with different soil types so that we can begin to appreciate how significant of a difference these properties can have on the failure process. This is a video of field testing performed by USDA's Agricultural Research Service on an extremely erodible material with extreme As you can see, the embankment essentially progressed from initiation to failure in 30 minutes. Now let's take a look at an embankment with less erodible soil. On this slide, we'll see a repeat of that exact same experiment conducted, but this time with a soil that has a value of this As you can see, it took much longer than a day for this embankment to completely fail. Not only is the process much slower, but it also looked quite a bit different. It's easy to see how we could miss the opportunity to intervene on the very erodible embankment, but 
would potentially have adequate time to detect a problem and fix it for this case. These are some of the reasons why estimating the soil erodibility or measuring it where it's really significant is extremely important for assessing the probabilities of failure due to internal erosion. Now let's take just a moment to get a high level overview of the toolbox that's been provided to aid in estimating erosion parameters. The toolbox consists of an Excel workbook with multiple worksheets. Each worksheet contains various methods for estimating soil erosion properties from a variety of sources. The worksheets provided provide means to estimate the critical shear stress for non-dispersive soils, the erodibility coefficient for non-dispersive soils. You can do these estimates based on data sets from the whole erosion test, or you can do it based on applications for other test data. Finally, there are also uh, worksheets to help estimate just broad erosion categories um, for compatibility with some of the other assessment tools used in analysis of embankment failure processes. Regarding that last bullet about the categories, I'd just like to make one final cautionary note. USCS soil classification has been clearly demonstrated to not be a good indicator of erosion properties. On this slide, you see compilations of jet and whole erosion test and EFA test data for various soil categories. Many of these categories have four orders of magnitude range in the critical shear stress values measured within a single soil type. For these reasons, it's highly encouraged that you rely more on the correlations that are appropriate for your soil type you're making estimates for than categorical classifications of erosion properties. Part of the reason for that broad range is because of the various factors that can influence the soil erodibility. As mentioned previously, the soil density and loading history can have a significant influence on those erosion parameters. For these reasons, it's important to be cognizant of the source information of the data sets that regressions are developed from. For example, USDA's jet erosion test data sets are often obtained from natural stream banks due to the problems of interest that they're engaged in. It's easy to see that those may correspond to loose and soft materials because they're just natural soil deposits. To the contrary, the EFA measurements are often for bridge scour. These samples are usually obtained through borings at depth below the ground surface. In some regions, these samples could be pre-glacial soil samples that are highly over-consolidated and heavily indurated soil deposits. For these types of soils, we could see how there might be a CL or CH soil type that is actually behaving more like rock. Those types of measurements would obviously not correspond directly to the similar scenario on those types of soils in an embankment. Since the NCHRP dataset is the most comprehensive compilation and analysis to date, the workflow we suggest is to use that study's results to work through and make estimates of parameters using the regression equations as your first pass. So some of those regression equations provide means to also estimate uncertainty. The mean value and uncertainty of the estimate should be carried through your risk assessment to determine if you have a problem. If you think you need further information at this point to evaluate the failure mode, you can dig deeper into the data set to try and rule out any potential data
that might not be directly relevant to your situation being evaluated. After that level of detail, you may have refined estimates of what you think the range of those parameters are, and we'll hopefully be able to screen out failure mechanisms. If at that point there's still concern with erosion-related failure modes, it may be necessary to actually run tests to measure the properties for your actual embankment or foundation being assessed. I've provided on this slide for your information. If any additional references cited are of interest, please feel free to reach out to us and we can assist you in obtaining the full citations. This concludes this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions or comments?